everybody, and welcome to another Agile IT Tech Talk. This is a very special one because we actually have, a, pardon me, Matt Sosman right here in the Agile IT offices. Um, <coughs> we've been discussing a lot of uh, current uh, security situations going on in the world today, um, along with some of the new technology that's available through Microsoft. Um, that we're doing this as a panel talk. So today we're also joined, in addition to Matt, we've got Maggie, who many of you have probably spoken to on the phone. Um, we've got Miguel, our senior cloud uh, engineer. And we've got Alex, our, uh, what, what did we call you last time? Our um, PowerShell ninja. Um, that sounds right. Yes. Yep. Alex the automator is here <laughs> with us as well. Um, and we're going to be talking about ransomware and ransomware defense. Um, so there's a lot of tools out there. We've touched upon this in previous tech talks, um, but there's also um, over the last couple weeks, we've heard about over a million dollars paid in ransom from Florida. The city of Baltimore is still trying to recover from attack five months ago. So this is really topical, particularly with our state, municipal and government. Um, yeah, because really it's <coughs> pertinent for everybody, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, ransomware can be, coming through supply chain attacks. So as MSPs, we're very cautious and secure with our environment because we're worried about the security of our clients. Um, so how are you doing today, Matt? Good, thank you for having me. How are you guys doing? Doing great. So good, glad you're here. Yeah, definitely glad you're here. <laughs> um, so let me go ahead and share over to you, Matt, and we can see it. Perfect. Excellent. This is complicated. It is. So you want to cover up one eye and um, and try to make out what's on this. And I'm just going to try to hide this here. That nobody can see that. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Um, so we're looking at a slide here called the Microsoft Cybersecurity Reference Architecture. And I know we're going to talk about ransomware, and, and it's, it's a it's a great story. What I think Microsoft provides is a really good story on how we can help protect our customers from ransomware. And what's interesting when you look at this diagram is these products, they are integrated with each other and talk to each other. And so um, not anything is 100% secure. And so as we know, if, if ransomware makes it through our first layer, what are the other layers that are in the way to make it as expensive as possible and try to minimize the impact that the ransomware has in the environment? So that's really what you're looking at here in this diagram. And so what I would like to do is show a few examples of yeah. how Microsoft helps to protect against ransomware. And um, as I show this, you know, guys, feel free to, to comment and, and jump in. Let's, let's have a discussion yeah. about it. So the first thing I want to show here is if I go to my, on my Windows 10 machine um, and I go to Windows Defender, this is built into Windows 10, all editions of Windows 10. And we added a new feature probably about a year, maybe two years ago, actually. And if I go into Windows Defender here and click on Virus and Threat Protection, I have an item here for ransomware protection. And when I click on Manage Ransomware Protection, we call this Controlled Folder Access. And when I enable this, this allows me to have this set of protected folders that if I do get hit by ransomware, it encrypts my computer, but anything in these folders, it will not touch. So it essentially denies that ransomware from having right access to these folders. Great. So having an eight-year-old, you said this is on every version of Windows. Windows yeah. Home? Windows Home as well. I know. what Spencer's getting enabled tonight. <laughs> this is the first thing I said at home for my wife. On her so I don't have an eight-year-old, but I have a lot of customers that probably need this. Do I have to give them an SOP on how to... Send it out to each individual user, or is there from, a way for me yeah, to that's a push great it question. to everyone? Yeah, great question, Maggie. So um, as you saw, I just enabled it by myself. Mm -hmm. um, you probably don't want to do that on a, on a per-user basis, so you could push that with policy, okay. you know, group policy uh, through Intune, if you had Intune as well, and, and establishing some kind of baseline yeah. for how you want to protect those folders. So you can see here over time I've added a few, my videos, documents, um, et cetera. But you can add another protected folder, so uh, maybe my OneDrive. If I'm using Dropbox, I can add Dropbox as a protected folder as well. So how is this different than like an access control list for the folder? Uh, so this is using uh, Windows Defender to look at the suspicious behavior that may be hitting the folder and then automatically responding. So it's not just a allow deny, it's a little bit more intelligent. Absolutely. Cool. Oh, cool. And so this can be managed, but also what's interesting, I'll show you more in a minute with Microsoft Defender ATP, I can get telemetry as an admin on if this is actually you know, working. So if ransomware hits my computer and this stops it, 
from encrypting my OneDrive or my, my documents, I could see that on the back end through a report. So that was one of the first things I wanted to show you. For me, that's low-hanging okay. fruit. Everybody out there should yeah, have Yeah, absolutely. Right? Um, the second thing I wanted to show you is, let's talk about that second layer of defense. Nothing's 100% secure. So if it does happen to make it through control folder access, how do I prevent data in my OneDrive from being encrypted by that, by that piece of ransomware? Well, here is OneDrive. And we've added a new feature about in the last year or so um, called Restore Your OneDrive. And so here I can actually go back in time at different versions of these documents in my OneDrive and restore it. So if uh, today I got hit by ransomware and it synchronized all the files in my OneDrive, I can come in here and I can go back to maybe yesterday and just restore all the files that are not synced. It's as simple as that. Great. And so again, this is just another basic feature. Um, I like it for not only ransomware, but if I'm sharing out files in my OneDrive and people are making unnecessary changes, I can just roll them back mm -hmm. because we're keeping multiple versions. And this is something we talked about with uh, Bob German mm -hmm. weeks ago in that you can do this on an individual file basis as well from within SharePoint and yes. Teams. Yep. Yes, yeah, it does apply to SharePoint and Teams as well. And you don't have to be an admin for any of this? You don't this have to be an just, admin. Me as just a regular just user. Me as a regular I user. Oh, cool. And that's, that's what I really love about our products is we're putting the user in control, right? Mm -hmm. Um, now, what I think is really interesting about this is this really helps me be better protected than storing data on a file server, right? We've been storing data on file servers for uh, decades. Putting it in a cloud source like OneDrive or SharePoint or Teams allows me to have that additional protection if I do need to roll it back. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to show you was with our product Cloud App Security. Now, this is going a little bit behind the scenes here and get a little technical, but with our product Cloud App Security, we could create what we call an anomaly detection policy. And to boil this down, here I have a policy for ransomware activity. And what this is doing is it's looking at those files being encrypted on your computer when they sync to OneDrive, or if you're using Dropbox or Box or Google Drive, when it goes to sync to that cloud service, it's going to look at those file extensions being synced. And if it detects things like .wannacry, .zzz, it's going to note that as ransomware, possible ransomware, and stop the sync. <coughs> and I can also have it automatically take action. So here you can see for Office 365, I can also suspend the user account. Great. Okay, low hanging fruit, right? My the, the data on my computer, it might be encrypted, but if I'm a good corporate citizen, I'm backing everything up to my OneDrive and that kind of thing, then this will help to protect me. Would suspending a user have that gets us block access to the mailbox as well? It would block access to the mailbox as well, and so. We're starting to see cloud ransomware now, where if I go in and click on a link in an email, it gives permissions to my entire Office 365 account, including my mailbox, and now that cloud ransomware is starting to encrypt data in my mailbox and elsewhere in Office 365. So by suspending the account, that helps protect me. And I have seen a real-time demonstration of what cloud ransomware looks like in G Suite, and it you literally see everything get encrypted going down the line. Scary. And if you want a really, really, really scary visual, yeah. um, that is one, is you're yeah. watching things <coughs> go south. Yeah, and so I, what I think is really interesting is uh, all of these controls, um, it's, as you can see, a, a check of a box, right? But you do have to understand how do you enable this, how do you go about planning for it, um, how do you roll this out? Yeah. But uh, it's, it's low-hanging fruit. Yeah, and that blocking of the sink, um, I was just here looking this up because I heard a story on NPR the other day. Up in Boston, um, I think it's the Public Defender's Office, the IT department saw the ransomware starting to hit. Oh. And they just shut everything down. They were literally turning off servers and pulling cords, going to individual workstations and unplugging them from walls and turning them on, hoping that they that had manually segmented their systems enough that they had stopped it from moving into the servers. Oh, that sounds... And they hadn't. Painful. Um, <laughs> and they hadn't. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, having that automatic, nope, just cut it off, instantly segmented. Just automatic. And even this control folder access is also built into server 2016 in a moment. And so you can also have it applied to a server. And so in that, in that case of rather than going around and unplugging all your servers, having some of these controls built in can really save you a lot of time. Could could those servers be managed via Ixin policy as well? So those servers can be managed with a product called Azure Security Center. And so that would allow us to, to manage those servers, manage policy on those servers. Um, Intune traditionally applies to my, my clients, but I can do some, some work there to also manage those servers. 
But again, it's, it's about that, that single security policy that applies to everywhere, servers, clients, cloud apps, whatever it may be, and that way you can respond within seconds. Otherwise, it takes days before you even find out, and by then it's too late. Right, and there are agents that will allow you to defend on-premise servers from cloud security. Yes. Yeah. yeah, just speaking of Azure Security Center, um, that protects, of course, things in Azure, but it also protects resources on-premises. So if you have a hybrid environment, I can protect those servers on-premises, but also servers and other clouds. So if you're using AWS or Google Cloud Platform, you know, we can protect it there as well. Again, it's about having that single that single policy that applies no matter, no matter where the data is. The last thing I want to show you here, and I'd be curious to see what you guys think about this, is using Microsoft Defender Advanced Threat Protection. Um, let's say that ransomware makes it past all of my defenses, control folder access, um, OneDrive uh, restore, my cloud app security policy, and let's say it's actually starting to execute on the machine. Well, here with Microsoft Defender ATP, I can actually see where that ransomware, in this case WannaCry, is starting to execute on some machines. And when I drill into this, I can get some information about what's happening. So here, I notice that uh, WannaCry is being ran. I get a really nice description and some recommended actions available to me. I can read more about what is WannaCry or that particular variant of ransomware. And then from here, I can scroll through this and I can see what is the activity that's happening. And I can drill into these suspicious files that are running WannaCry. And I can get even more information about it in my environment and what's happening. Now, again, the cool thing about Microsoft technology and why I get so, so, so crazy about this is the integration. You can see over here on the right, it's talking to Office 365. So it knows if this kind of malware, in this case ransomware, is in an email inbox somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I can go out and take action on it. Um, there's a lot of interesting visibility and insights I get when I'm using these products together to uh, help protect the environment. One last thing I want to show you here on this is if I come into Microsoft Defender ATP and I scroll through this, this timeline and I start to drill into these, um, from here I can do a deep analysis and I can actually upload this to Microsoft and one of the Microsoft security analysts will take a look at it as well. So if you're not sure if it's a ransomware or not, we can help you um, figure that out. Again, all the tools are available. And um, again, it's, it's a matter of being able to apply these tools in such a way that's cost effective and makes sense for the business. But as you guys see, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy to protect yourself just by doing a few simple mm -hmm. things. Um, I'm just gonna bring up a, a, a page here that um, I was just looking at as we were uh, set up the call here. And I'm sure a lot of you remember uh, this news story. And so what I think is really interesting about this is those dollar amounts on what they spent to recover. And um, you know, this is just one organization out of thousands out there, if not tens of thousands. And um, a lot of this could be prevented had they taken the right actions. Right. Well, something that I've heard in stories recently is that um, cybersecurity insurance firms are opting to, instead of pay for the remediation, are opting to pay the ransom. But in the case of, was it WannaCry that actually had no way to decrypt? It was a one way, it encrypted and, okay, sorry yeah. Charlie, you're done. It was meant to take out infrastructure. That's or a, it was just poorly engineered. That's a really good <laughs> point, Sean. Um, you don't know if these ransomware, these crypto lockers uh, mm -hmm. are actually gonna pay you, right? It says, hey, enter, enter, enter your wallet ID for Bitcoin, but you don't know that you're actually gonna uh, be able to unlock yeah, your data. Back, right? And so that's where a good backup and recovery strategy comes in too. I mean, at the end of the day, what's the last resort? It's restored from a backup. And so let's make sure that the data is properly being backed up as well. And there's a, a process in place to, to take care of that. Yeah, and there, I mean, beyond just the Bitcoin cost, you've got uh, the city of Baltimore got hit. And it's been four months, five months now. They, just last week, they finally got their electronic um, parking meters to start working again. Mm -hmm. um, a month ago, an article came out that 65% of city employees could use their computers again. They were using Less paper. Less lost productivity. Yeah, Ouch. and when you think about in a, on a city municipal level, like, I'm, I'm sure that the red lights are running on Arduino or whatever down there in the box. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's a Stuxnet for 
red light, green light. But you think about the parking meters, and right there you've got this instant recognition of what the cost is. Lost oh, well, yeah. we were doing $750,000 in parking meters, and we lost that for three months. Yeah. And that price is still going up. Yeah. And about every month you can jump up, read a Baltimore newspaper, and see what the cost is, and it's getting into eight figures. You know, what, uh, what What keeps me up at night is the ransomware that hits mission critical systems. So when Petya and WannaCry hit, there were um, healthcare organizations that had to turn patients away for surgery. There were healthcare, organiza healthcare organizations that had to uh, basically turn off, you know, life-saving devices because they couldn't use them because mm -hmm. they were hit by ransomware. And those devices are running ages-old versions of operating mm -hmm. systems that have never been patched. And so it is very scary. but. You know, again, it has to be a priority, especially in the C-suite, and not just in IT. We we got to have a plan in place. Absolutely. You know, and there unfortunately there has to be an investment up front to be able to make sure that you minimize the, the, the risk of this. Yeah, and Miguel, you and I did the tech talk recently about the Department of Homeland Security, the security remediations they were talking about. But now we're seeing DHS, the FBI, everybody in the government is coming out with new security recommendations on certain things because they're recognizing these advanced persistent persistent threats. These state actors will go after organizations. Um, what was the big shipping company? Um, and they can take out infrastructure by going after an individual private company. So we're all part of national defense now. Mm -hmm. um, and that that keeps me up at night. Yeah. Is, oh, my son's going to click a bad link and take out the electricity grid for yep. San Diego. Not really likely, yep. but. You it's, never it's, know possible. it's possible, it's especially possible. with nation states, right? These are these are um, organizations that have almost unlimited funding and unlimited resources. And so it's not the teenagers in your parents' basement. It's it's real life thousands and thousands of people that um, that are there that are doing these things. And so um, that, that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is if you look at the consumer market and digital thermostats and voice assistants and all of these other IoT devices in the home, that also keeps me up in mind. Botnets and DDoS. Absolutely. Um, one other thing here, and I'd be interested to get your thoughts on this. You know, I, I have a slide up here around uh, Windows 10, and if you look at a piece of ransomware like like Petya, and you look at all the features available in Windows 10, you know, question comes up is, could we have actually prevented it? So if it if it gets into the environment, could all the features in Windows 10 prevented it from being installed and spreading? So maybe it hits one or two computers in the environment, but if other Machines, maybe mission critical machines had these features enabled, could it have prevented it from spreading further? I think that's an interesting question. And here you can see different features of Windows from device guard to credential guard to kernel hardening. Um, these are features that are built into Windows. And so, uh, with the exception of, of credential guard, that comes in our, our enterprise edition of Windows, but in Home and Pro, you do get these other features built in. So. Um, it's just a matter of enabling them and, and you know, rolling them out in a fashion that makes sense. And to take it a little bit outside of ransomware, um, looking at stage three here with Secure Boot, there were CVEs in this Batch Tuesday um, that are regarding the Secure Boot. Is somebody found a zero day exploit um, and the patch is there? So you've got to stay yeah. on top of the patching. It's still the boring stuff. Yes. Um, but there's so much there to enable the automatic controls and protection. In the security community, we have a saying. And the saying is, go back to go back to your basics, and the basics are passwords and patching. Right. Right? Complex yep. passwords, multi-factor authentication, the basics around passwords, and then patching. Patch your stuff. Make sure servers and machines, PCs are up to date. If you're using a Mac, make sure that's up to date. Router switches, anything that runs software on it, make sure you're checking for updates or have it set to automatically check for updates. And have a plan around that. And not to do a shameless plug, but we had the um, SQL Server uh, when end of yes. support two days ago, um, and there will be no more security updates. Now there's a way to get the three years of security updates by moving that workload into Azure, but we're six months away from this happening with Windows Server. Uh, was it 2008, 2009? 2008. 2008. Yes, yeah, so Windows Server 2008 <laughs> and Windows 7 are going EOS in January. Yep. And there are ways you can move it up to the cloud if you have those mission critical pieces of software that don't fit in to Windows 10 yet, uh, that we've got ways that we can adapt those softwares for you. Um, there's also the Aperture program, but really get those, be ready for when you're no longer gonna get those updates. Uh, Absolutely. I know somebody 
in this room and people in the listening to the call right now, people watching on YouTube, you all know somebody who's still got XP running somewhere. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I ran an Active Directory health check a couple weeks ago and found wow. a few XP machines, include there's that and Small Business Server 2003. And their application, they require this really old piece yep. of operating system to totally get it. Wow. But let's isolate it, right? Yes. Like, yep. do not let it have access to the rest of the yes. network. Yep. Yeah. And that's it. You can build defenses around these yep. old things. Yep. Yeah. But best practice <laughs> make your app not, don't yeah. have the old things. <laughs> yep. And, and you know, the, the other side of this coin, too, is it, it really has to be a priority for the business. This is not the IT person or the technical person or even levels, the vendor or the partner saying you need to do this. It's It has to be a, a priority at the, at the senior leadership level because everybody's digital these days. They rely on their website, email, e commerce. And um, if you get hit by ransomware, like we see in some of these organizations in the news, you can go out of business. Yeah. And uh, we, we've seen that. Yeah. And so, um, and, and you know, again, your data is everything. It's your intellectual property, it's your accounting, it's your, your, your data for your clients. And so, you know, that data has to be made available. And if you don't have that data, there goes your business. And so mm -hmm. it's really important. Um, you know, Sean, you mentioned CVEs. Uh, inside uh, Microsoft Defender Advanced Threat Protection, I can actually see the CVEs that are out there, and I can see which machines in my environment are actually exposed to those CVEs, and then I can drill into this, and I can see even more about that particular CVE, and I can also see which machines in my environment are exposed to that, and then go out there and, and take action on a broad scale. So if anything, I just want to know what is my posture. I can use tools like this to, mm -hmm. to help see that. I've yeah. seen this screen a few times. I yep. believe many in our uh, our uh, service team sees yep. this screen quite a bit because we're out there looking out for you guys. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, there's another website, um, the Zero Day Project, yes. where you're able to actually see which ones are presently under attack. Yes. And so you have Patch Tuesday, you have Exploit Wednesday, yep. where all the script kitties are sitting there, they're waiting for the patches to come out, and they go, oh, here we go. Now here's a POC. I can take this code, and I'm going to give this a good right. shot. Right, and, and that's and that's where it comes down. It's it's, it's a whack-a-mole game, right? Yep. We we patch something over right. here, and something else comes up over here. And so um, you got to have multiple layers. You got to make sure you do the basics, passwords, and patching. You got to make sure you have the right policies in place, like we talked about, controlled folder access and that kind of thing. But then again, backup, right? It's so and important. All else fails, we got to have a backup strategy. How do we restore it? How are we testing the backups? That whole and it's, plan. And it's more about the restore than the backups, yes. right? It's, all right, you've been backing it up. Right. But now it's going to take you three months to restore all the data. Right. Right? Like making sure that you really have that restore strategy and those restore tests. If, if you can restore the data. If the data is out, to be restored. Yes. There right. you go. And I can't remember the city off right. the top of my head. I read this stuff all the time. But there was a case where a city got hit by ransomware. And they went, okay, let's pull the backups. They've been doing backups for years. But never tested. Never did a restore test. Well, and yeah. nope, that data, it was just not yeah. backing up correctly. The important thing to know here is that a lot of these things are sometimes presented in the dashboard. And having a green checkbox next to it does not necessarily mean that Correct. the backup exactly. is Very consistent. Yeah. And it is valid to be reused. So that's another part of this whole malware protection strategy and security strategy for an organization is how often do those backups get validated. Mm -hmm. And if you were to do a simulation of an attack or ransomware, things like that, how would how prepared are you to do a full backup? Like how how yeah. periodic is that data getting backed up? You may see that you have archive folders that don't need to get backed up that often, but there are other folders that do. And how often is that backup strategy revised as well? Mm -hmm. And what's your retention policy? What if that ransomware has been sitting there for three months? Do you have a copy from four months ago? Yeah. Yeah, and that was one of the things that happened uh, with um, that public defender's office is what they found was the ransomware had been completely through the system yep. for about a week and a half. And then it just, yep. whether it was a command and control server said go, um, but it went. Right. And every server was just it didn't have to laterally expand. Expand. It already had done it. Right. right. One. Of the, you know. Speaking of backup. Um, now, this is not applying to servers, but for my my PC, I try to be a good corporate citizen. I try to store all of my data in OneDrive, Teams, and SharePoint. Every now and then, I put things on my desktop. Right. Because it's just it's easy. Right. It's just yeah. it's just simple and easy. So built into OneDrive, we now have this ability to do uh, folder redirection. 
And essentially, it's taking your desktop folder, pictures folder, documents folder, and it's backing those folders up to OneDrive. So I will literally have these folders in my OneDrive folder. It feels like you're working on your desktop, exactly. but it does, it's all in the cloud anyway. Exactly. Yeah. We actually, and we do that for a number of our clients. Oh, that's we have that. We've got a PowerShell script that can just run silently in the background. Now yep. you're set up. In our modern workplace expert, Kristen, I know is uh, watching right now. Um, this, more than just security, I have this little service in front of me, but I've got the crazy gaming machine because I'm the marketing guy that needs to be able to do video production, which I'll be doing with this once this is over. Um, but when I'm on my Surface, it feels exactly like my desktop because all my folders are just yeah. synced with Office 365, everything's synced. So this is great for productivity as much as it is for security. It's interesting you mention that. In a security space, a lot of folks think that more security means less productivity, and I have to find yep. the balance. What I really like about what Microsoft is doing, and this is a great example, is we're actually helping you be more productive by enabling security. So we're backing up your folders from desktop pictures and documents. It's now being stored in OneDrive. And so I have multiple machines. My data is now going everywhere with me. I'm instantly more productive. It's not even my machine. I have, I went to Texas to visit my husband's family last week. Did not have my Surface book. Had my husband's MacBook Pro. Was able to log in and get everything that I needed to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I work from the web client from my desktop at home. Right. Another, my desktop at home is also another crazy gaming machine because I'm that guy. <laughs> but we got the Xbox a couple weeks ago. And the first thing I was, I wonder, can we run Teams on the Xbox? Yeah. You can. <laughs> um, I've also seen Teams. I believe you shared it, uh, running on the dashboard of a Tesla, was it? Yeah, yeah, I logged into Teams Holy on my Tesla, Tesla. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can run it from anywhere. Yeah. My technology cannot do that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just it's amazing, though, yeah. right? Yeah. This is just one example of being more productive with security. I mean, there, there doesn't have to be that balance anymore. It, it actually, it's, it's a reality. And to yeah. circle back to a really important point you made is this really does need to have buy-in from the yes. C-suite. Yes. And when you can say, hey, listen, we're going to have measurable business results from productivity increases as well as measurable security uh, posture improvements. It, it helps become a, it helps get them to be a little bit more proactive because it's their concern whether they know it or not. Yeah, if right. they lose their all of their business data or they lose the ability to do business, well, they're concerned. Um, so we need to be, get them to yep. be proactive and show them, hey, Look, we can do good things that will make everybody happy while yeah. also doing good things that will make everyone secure. And just put a spin on that. Um, to make even more of a priority, think about the California Consumer Privacy Act, yep. GDPR. It's not just a European Union thing. Uh, it could actually apply to folks in the United States, CCPA. And so being compliant does require security. And so yeah. making this a business priority can also help them in that respect. And then just the other comment I would make is, from a business, your clients, no matter the industry you're in, they're expecting that their vendor or whoever you are to them mm -hmm. has that level of security, mm -hmm. that you're protecting their data, that you're collecting their data in a matter that makes it secure and compliant. Right. Yeah, and I mean, we just saw uh, Marriott, I think it was. And actually, I'm going to back away from saying any name on this one, but there was a hotel and hospitality chain that was just recently had the biggest GDPR fine ever. And the CCPA, which is the California um, Consumer Privacy Act that you mentioned, that goes into effect January 1st. It has sharper teeth and more controls than GDPR. Um, and for those of you watching online, there will be a link to our blog from a couple weeks ago talking about it because you, we're able to manage that with Security and Compliance Center. Um, so yeah. all those controls can be put in and you can manage your audits and how your user data and PII is is handled. And so, yeah. Sean, just to... As a quick recap, who does that affect? I mean, is that just companies in California? Ah, thank you. So, no, if you do business with anyone in California, so I'm here in California, wonderful San Diego, and I log into HubSpot, which is in Boston, my data has to be protected to CCPA. So this is going to be a huge snowball effect this, because GDPR was primarily focused towards the European community. Mm -hmm. Right. So sure. then there were, we, we, we had that with certain financial institutions that we have to put safeguards in place. But international international business, although common, not that mainstream. Right now, e-commerce well, is just going to. I've been to at least two dozen websites where it just says right at the bottom, this site is not intended for uh, members of the European Union. Um, so go ahead and cut <laughs> California yeah. out of your user base. Right. It's not going to happen. 
But the other thing is that the CCPA was created as a reaction to the fact that we could not get anything through federally for consumer information mm -hmm. protection. And so California just said, okay, let's go. But the CCPA is also being used as a framework right now. And I'm talking off the top of my head, I know that New York, I believe Massachusetts, but there are 12 to 15 other states already using CCPA for their own acts that are coming out. So and more we'll, states are to follow suit then. Oh, yeah. Right, but the biggest problem we're gonna have is that it's gonna be patchwork. And so, okay, well, you can't do thing A here. You can't do thing B here. Um, I was listening to a uh, interview with um, the owner of Woodstock's Pizza talking about the fact that, oh, well, we've got 20 pizza restaurants, but because we're in so many different counties and cities, we have so many different regulations that we've created our own baseline based upon the strictest policy in each area. And that's what I wanted to just get to also is, so the baseline that we are able, or someone will be able to deploy, but it based off the more strict policy that they're needed yeah. to. Yep. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, to kind of, to kind of funnel all this up to ransomware, it, it's, a, it's a big deal. And, it and in terms of the, um, the cyber security industry out there, there's really two big um, big things out there. It's, it's email phishing and mm -hmm. it's ransomware. Because it is extremely cheap for an attacker, whether it's a teenager in the basement of their parents' house or it's a nation state, right. extremely cheap for them to send ransomware through an email and a phishing campaign and then run that ransomware on your machine. You could buy this on the dark web. I mean, this is readily available. And so that's why it's so prevalent. And, and also it just, it's, it's very dangerous because again, like we've seen in the news, it can shut down businesses. Yeah. So we, we've got to make it a priority. Um, the last thing I'll mention here, just on the Microsoft side of things, is I, I do have a, uh, a blog article here that we can make available to Sean so he can post it. But uh, we recently wrote an article here about how we're using our products and uh, what makes Microsoft unique in the security space, like our security intelligence graph, mm -hmm. and using that to combat things like email phishing and ransomware. And so as you go through this article, you'll learn about some of the products, but then how we're helping to automatically remediate and protect you before you even do anything happen. And so what I find interesting is in this little infographic here, uh, there was 5 million cloud threats that were detected in 2018 and 5 billion phishing emails blocked in 2018. And, and if you start digging into this around vulnerabilities and malicious signing attempts, it's not just ransomware, but it's everything. Microsoft has a lot of technology in place that can actually block this before it ever even comes down to an organization or, or one yeah. of our customers. So these are all things to keep in mind with your cloud provider and your technology provider is, is understand what they can do. And again, enabling those, those low hanging fruit items. Oh, yeah. I think also yeah. you touched on a good point, Matt, where it's defense in depth, right? It's yes. no longer a single tool. It's no longer a firewall is not going to protect me. An antivirus sweep is not going to protect Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. In fact, I have a really good um, uh, visual of that that we'll just bring up. I know we're kind of getting close to time here, so let me be quick. Um, you're going to see a lot of slides here, but if I show you this, and I can make this available to Sean as well so he can share it out. but. Um, when we think about defense in depth, I joke around, I call it my tinfoil hat, but in all reality, you have to think like this because nothing's 100% effective, and these attackers are really good. Mm -hmm. And so you got to make sure you have all of your boxes checked here. Everything from the, the PC that it's running on to your server, to the network, to the data itself, and everything beyond that. So all good things to think about when it comes to security and ransomware. But, um, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, thank you very much, Matt. Yeah, thank you for um, It's always me. fun to talk about this stuff with you. It was really nice to have everybody in the room together talking. Um, so for those of you that don't work at Agile IT, um, this is kind of what we do when we sit around <laughs> and have lunch. Um, so this, is, this has been really fun. Um, I want to give a reminder that we will not have a Tech Talk next week. Most of our team will be off at Microsoft Inspire. But if you follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn, um, I probably won't do any of that Facebook stuff. We will be going live from Inspire. I've got a couple people I'm gonna be doing live videos from there. Um, I'm gonna try to put that together in time for what would be next week's Tech Talk. I don't know if we'll be able to do it because I'm gonna be editing video from a hotel room and finding out about all the cool stuff that's gonna be happening in the coming year. Um, but definitely give us a follow on social media. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, we'll go live there as well. And yeah, give us a like and follow and we'll see you next week. <laughs>